Hello and welcome. My name is Alan. Pull you a seat up. Grab you a drink. We're back with more. A testimonial hope, the writings and speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Today we'll be getting into another book Dr. King wrote called The Strength of Love. So let's go ahead and just hop into this. The blurb reads, Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the great preachers of the 20th century. He embellished his graceful cadence with a disciplined commitment to uh, To grand themes. His mellow baritone voice could soar toward the sweet relief that only clarity and insight can provide and then collapse in the often somber or sober embrace all finely woven uh, of finely woven metaphors. He refused to accept the false dichotomy between faith and intellectual preaching. One way he stayed in touch with common folk was to preach practically every week. In fact, he delivered some of his finest sermons uh, in the pulpit of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. It was difficult, but he did find enough time to sometimes take care of his pastoral duties of visiting the sick and caring for the material needs of his congregation, which he served as co-pastor along with his father. Therefore, his sermons were often pastoral in nature and reflected a broad range of deep personal and public concerns. The now classic sample of the sermons of the numerous ones he delivered at Ebenezer and elsewhere were collected in the strength of love, the soul of a spiritual genius is re revealed in this collection of sermons. Chapter 1, A Tough Mind and a Tender Heart Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Matthew 10, 16. A French philosopher said, no man is strong unless he bears within his character antitheses strongly marked. The strong man holds on a living blend strongly marked in a living blend strongly marked opposite. Not, ordinary, not ordinarily do men achieve this balance of opposites. The idealists are not usually realistic, and the realists are not usually idealistic. The militant are not generally known to be passive, and the passive to be militant. Seldom are the humble self assertive or the self-assertive humble. But life at its best is a creative synthesis of opposites in fruitful harmony. The philosopher Hegel said that truth is found neither in the thesis nor in the antithesis, but 
in an emergent synthesis which reconciles the two. Jesus recognized the need for blending opposites. He knew that his disciples would face a difficult and hostile world where they would confront the recalcitrance of political officials and the transigence of the protectors of the old order. He knew that they would meet code and arrogant men whose hearts had been hardened by the long winter of traditionalism. So he said to them, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. And he gave them a formula for action. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. This is pretty difficult to imagine that a single person having simultaneously the characteristics of the serpent and the dove. But this is what Jesus expects. We must combine the toughness of the serpent and the softness of the dove, a tough mind and a tender heart. Let us consider first the need for a tough mind characterized by incisive thinking, realistic appraisal, and decisive judgment. The tough mind is sharp and penetrating, breaking through the crust of legends and myths and lifting the true from the false. The tough-minded individual is astute and discerning. He has a strong, austere quality that makes for firmness of purpose and solidness of commitment. Who doubts that this toughness of mind is one of the great of man's greatest needs? Rarely do we find that this toughness of mind or sorry, rarely do we find men who willingly engage in hard, solid thinking. There is an almost universal quest for easy answers and half-baked solutions. Nothing pains some people more than having to think. The prevalent tendency toward soft-mindedness is found in man's unbelievable gullibility. Take our attitude toward advertisement. We are so easily led to purchase a product based or purchase a product because a television or radio advertisement pronounces it better than any other. Advertisers have long since learned that most people are soft minded and they capitalize on this susceptibility with skillful and effective slogans. This undue gullibility is also seen in the tendency of many readers to accept the printed word of the press as final truth. Few people realize that even our authentic channels of information, the press, the platform, and in many instances, the pulpit, do not give us objective and unbiased truth. Few people have seen, have the toughness of mind to judge critically and to discern the true from the false, a fact, the fact from fiction. Our minds are constantly being invaded by legions of half-truths, prejudices, and false facts. One of the great needs of mankind is to be lifted above the morass of false propaganda. Soft-minded individuals are prone to embrace all kinds of superstitions. Their minds are constantly invaded by irrational fears, which 
range from fear of Friday the 13th to fear of a black cat crossing one's path. As the elevator made its upward climb in one of the large hotels in New York City, I noticed for the first time that there was no 13th floor. Floor 14 followed floor 12. On inquiring from the elevator operator the reason for this omission, he said this practice is followed by most large hotels because of the fear of numerous people to stay on a 13th floor. Then he added, the real foolishness of the fear is to be found in the fact that the 14th floor is actually the 13th. Such fears leave the soft mind haggard by day and haunted by night. The soft-minded man always fears change. He feels scrutiny in the status quo and has an almost morbid fear for the new. For him, the greatest pain is the pain of a new idea. An elderly segregationist in the South is reported to have said, I have come to see now that desegregation is inevitable, but I pray God it will not take place until after I die. The soft-minded person always wants to freeze the moment and hold life in the gripping yoke of sameness. Soft-mindedness often invades religion. This is why religion has sometimes rejected new truth with a dogmatic passion. Through edicts and bulls, inquisitions and excommunication, the church has attempted to pro prorogue truth and place an impenetrable stone wall in the path of the truth seeker. The historical phil philological criticism of the Bible is considered by the soft-minded as blasphemous. And reason is often looked upon as the exercise of a corrupt faculty. Soft-minded persons have revised the Beatitudes to read, Blessed are the pure of in ignorance, for only for they shall see God. This has also led to the widespread belief that there is a conflict between science and religion. But this is not true. There may have been a conflict between soft-minded religionists and tough-minded scientists, but not between science and religion. Their respective worlds are different and their methods are dissimilar. Science investigates. Religion interprets. Science gives man knowledge, which is power. Religion gives man wisdom, which is control. Science deals mainly with facts. Religion deals mainly with values. The two are not rivals. <clears throat> They are com complementary. Science keeps religion from sinking into the valley of crippling irrationalism and paralyzing obscurantism. Religion prevents science from falling into the harsh and obsolete materialism and moral nihilism. We do not need to look far to detect the dangers of soft-mindedness. Dictators capitalizing on soft-mindedness have led men 
to acts of barbarity and terror that are unthinkable in civilized society. Adolf Hitler realized that soft-mindedness was so prevalent among his followers that he said, I use emotion for the many and reserve reason for the few. In Mein Kampf, he asserted, by means of shrewd lies, unremittingly repeated, it is possible to make people believe that heaven is hell, that hell, heaven. The greater the lie, the more readily it will be believed. Soft-mindedness is one of the basic causes of race prejudice. The tough-minded person always examines the facts before he reaches conclusions. In short, he post-judges. The tender-minded person re teaches or reaches a conclusion before he has examined the first fact. In short, he prejudges and is prejudiced. Race prejudice is based on groundless fears, suspicions, and misunderstandings. There are those who are sufficiently soft-minded to believe in the superiority of the white race and the inferiority of the Negro race in spite of the tough-minded research of anthropologists who reveal the falsity of such a notion. There are soft-minded persons who argue that racial segregation should be perpetuated because Negroes lag behind in academic health and moral standards. They are not tough-minded enough to realize that lagging standards are the result of segregation and discrimination. They do not recognize that it is rationally unsound and sociologically untenable to use the tragic effects of segregation as an argument for its continuation. Too many politicians in the South recognize this disease of soft-mindedness which engulfs their constituency. The insidious zeal they make inflammatory statements and disseminate distortions and half-truths which arouse abnormal fears and morbid antip antipathies, antipathies within the minds of uneducated and underprivileged whites, leaving them so confused that they are led to acts of meanness and violence with no, which no normal person commits. There is little hope for us until we become tough-minded enough to break loose from the shackles of prejudice, half-truths, and downright ignorance. The shape of the world today does not permit us the luxury of soft-mindedness. A nation or a civilization that continues to produce soft-minded men purchases its own spiritual death on an installment plan. But we must not stop with the cultivation of a tough mind. The gospel also demands a tender heart. Tough-mindedness without tender-heartedness is cold and, de and detached, leaving one's personal life in a perpetual winter, devoid of the warmth of spring and the gentle heat of summer. What is more tragic than to see a person who has risen to the disciplined heights of tough-mindedness, but has the same, at the same time, sunk to the passionless depths of hard-heartedness.
the hard-hearted person never truly loves. He engages in a crass utilitarianism which values other people mainly according to their usefulness to him. He never experiences the beauty of friendship because he is too cold to feel, re feel affection for another and too self-centered to share another's joy and sorrow. He is an isolated island. No outpouring of love links him to the mainland of humanity. The hard-hearted person lacks the capacity for genuine compassion. He is unmoved by the pains and afflictions of his brothers. He passes unfortunate men every day, but he never really sees them. He gives dollars to a worthwhile charity, but he gives not of his spirit. The hard-hearted individual never sees people as people, but rather as mere objects or as impersonal cogs in an ever-turning will. In the vast will of industry, he sees men as hands. In the massive will of big city life, he sees men as digits on a mul in a multitude. In the deadly will of army life, he sees men as numbers of a regiment. He depersonalizes life. Jesus frequently illustrated the characteristics of the hard-hearted. The rich fool was condemned not because he was not tough-minded, but rather because he was not tender-hearted. Life for him was a mirror in which he saw only himself and not a window through which he saw other selves. Dives went to hell not because... Er, Divas went to hell not because he was wealthy, but because he was not tender-hearted enough to see Lazarus and because he made no attempt to bridge the gulf between himself and his brother. Jesus reminds us that the good life combines the toughness of the serpent and the tenderness of the dove. To have serpent-like qualities devoid of dove-like qualities is to be passionless, mean, and selfish. To have dove-like qualities without serpent-like qualities is to be sentimental, anemic, and aimless. We must not combine, or sorry, we must combine strongly marked antitheses. We as Negroes must bring together tough mindedness and tender heartedness if we are to move creatively toward the goal of freedom and justice. Soft minded individuals among us feel the only that the only was to deal with oppression is by adjusting to it. The acquiesce and resign, they acquiesce and resign themselves to segregation. They prefer to remain oppressed. When Mo Moses led the children of Israel from the slavery of Egypt to the freedom of the promised land, he discovered that slaves do not always welcome their deliverers. They would rather hear those ills they have, as Shakespeare pointed out, than flee to others that they know not of. They prefer the flesh pots of Egypt 
to the ordeals of emancipation. But this is not the way out. Soft-minded acquiescence is cowardly. My friends, we cannot win the respect of the white people of the South or elsewhere if we are willing to trade the future of our children for our personal safety and comfort. Moreover, we must learn that passively to accept an unjust system is to cooperate with the system and thereby to become a participant in its evil. And there are hard-hearted and bitter individuals among us who would combat the opponents with physical violence and corroding hatred. Violence brings only temporary victories. Violence, by creating many more social problems than it solves, never brings permanent peace. I am convinced that if we succumb to the temptation to use violence in our struggle for freedom, unborn generations will be the recipients of a long and desolate night of bitterness and our chief legacy to them will be a never-ending reign of chaos, a voice echoing through the corridors of time says to every intemperate Peter, put up thy sword. History is cluttered with the wreckage of nations that failed to follow Christ's command. A third way to open in our quest for freedom, namely nonviolent resistance, that combines tough-mindedness and tender-heartedness and avoids the complacency of do-nothingness of the soft-minded and the violence and bitterness of the hard-hearted. My belief is that this method must guide our action in the present crisis in race relations. Through nonviolent resistance, we shall be able to oppose the unjust system and at the same time love the perpetrators of the system. We must work passionately and unrelentingly for full stature as citizens. We, but may it never be said, my friends that to gain it, we use the inferior methods of falsehood, malice, hate, and violence. I would not conclude without applying the meaning of the text to the nature of God. The greatness of our God lies in the fact that he is both tough-minded and tender-hearted. He has qualities both of austerity and of gentleness. The Bible, always clear in stressing both attributes of God, expresses his tough-mindedness in his justice and wrath and his tender-heartedness in his love and grace. God has two outstretched arms. One is strong enough to surround us with justice and one gentle enough to embrace us with, his, with grace. On one hand, God is a God of justice who punished Israel for her wayward deeds. And on the other hand, he is a forgiving father whose heart was filled with unutterable joy when the prodigal returned home. I am thankful that we worship a God who is both tough-minded and tender-hearted. If God were only tough-minded, he would be a cold, passionless despot, 
sitting in some far off heaven contemplating all as Tennyson puts it in the Palace of Art. He would be Aristotle's unmoved mover, self-knowing but not other loving. But if God were only tender-hearted, he would be too soft and sentimental to function when things go wrong and incapable of controlling what he has made. He would be like H.G. Wells' lovable God in God the Invisible King, who is strongly desirous of making a good world, but finds himself helpless before the surging powers of evil. God is neither hard-hearted nor soft-minded. He is tough-minded enough to transcend the world. He is tender-hearted enough to live in it. He does not leave us alone in our agonies and struggles. He seeks us in dark places and suffers with us for or suffers with us and for us in our tragic prodigality. At times we need to know that the Lord is a God of justice when slumbering giants of injustice emerge in the earth, we need to know that there is a God of power who can cut them down like the grass and leave them withering like the green herb. When our most tireless efforts fail to stop the sweep of oppression, we need to know that in this universe is a God whose matchless strength is a fit contrast to the sordid weakness of man. But there are also times when we need to know that God possesses love and mercy. When we are staggered by the chilly winds of adversity and battered by the raging storms of disappointment and when through our folly and sin we stray into some destructive far country and are frustrated because of a strange feeling of homesickness, we need to know that there is someone who loves us, cares for us, understands us, and will give us another chance. When days grow dark and nights grow dreary, we can be thankful that our God combines in his nature a creative synthesis of love and justice, which will lead us through life's dark valleys and into sunlit pathways of hope and fulfillment. So yeah, that's the end of that portion. So yeah, Dr. King talking about there is a need for tough-mindedness. Just don't accept what you're told. Confirm it. And yeah, but also... Be tender-hearted. You often see in many movies today, or older movies sometimes, the scientist who is purely so scientific that he is very unmoved by others in their plights. Or you'll see religious fanatics who do things in the name of their religion because they believe that is what their God told them to do. 
And in truth, we need the tough-mindedness of science. We need that, you know, I want to confirm this. I, I need to verify this theory. Verification, you know, as they do in science where you have to, a theory is proposed or a hypothesis proposed and science puts it to the test. And it keeps being put to the test if truly checked. Um, and if it is a good hypothesis, it becomes a true theory. Uh, one of which we are unable to debunk. And then also in science, or also in religion, you have, you know... It talks about being uh, faithful to the God. Or you have things like Sodom and Gomorrah. So yeah, but that'll be it for this episode. As always, educate thyself. Think, read, study, learn. Someone tries to tell you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. I'll see you all in the next episode. Until then, later. <laughs>